All right, get your Bibles out, turn to Matthew. In the time we have left, we are continuing on in our series. We're actually continuing to celebrate 40 years of a faithful God and faithful people. And, uh, and, and that's what you know, the heart of this church is. We serve a faithful God, and God works through faithful people. And so we've been looking over the course of these, this month. Uh, my, my dad, the founding pastor, for those who may not know, um, founded this church in 1981. I was 13 years old. I've been blessed to grow up here. And actually, I'm a graduate of New Braunfels High School, so I'm glad to be a part of this community for a long time. I look forward to many more years in the surrounding area. Um, so he's always... Uh, shared his vision and heart for the church. And let me, it's important for me to say that because it doesn't change. How we do church doesn't, how we do church changes and, and we're four decades in now and there's next generations here and you know, the culture's changed a little bit, but the mission and purpose of God changes not. The vision is still the same. We just maybe carry out a little different, right? You understand that, right? And, and furthermore, the church is not our church and the church is not the Duncan church. The church is God's church, amen? The church is the church of Jesus, and Jesus is building his church. And so my dad taught a series in 1995. He passed away in 96. He taught that series, and I've been listening to it over the, all, the year, all these years. And, and he, he says this. He goes, I believe this is the marching orders for Tree of Life Church on into our future. And I believe the same listening to that. It's the same spirit and vision. So last week we shared a little bit about the importance of the people, God's people. The measure of a great church is, is its people. That heart has always been there. Uh, today, I want to take that. We want to be people of purpose. One of the things that keeps us marching forward in the things of God to fulfill our divine destiny is being a people of purpose. We have a purpose that we lock into, established by God. So let's take a look real quick in Matthew. I want to give you a little bit of uh, setup, if I will, build a little foundation here for the message today. It says this, Matthew 16, 18. And I tell you that you are Peter. There was an exchange between Jesus and his disciples. Who, who do man say that I am? And then he said, who do you say I am? And Peter bravely pipes up and says, you are the Messiah, you are the son of the living God, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus responds and says, you are right, you didn't learn this just on your own, the Father in heaven revealed that to you. This is a heavenly revelation. And then he says this in verse 18, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades or hell will not overcome it. On this revelation that you had, Peter. Let's take a look in, in Hebrews 16, the same scripture, but from the amplified uh, translation, it says this, and I tell you you are Peter, which is the Greek word, the Greek word would be Petros, a large piece of rock, now he's referring to the man, you're right, Peter, and you're a strong man, and you have divine revelation, and that's a strength for you. But he says then, but I'm not building my church on you. You're a rock, and I'm thankful for that. But he goes on to say, and on this rock, meaning the revelation, is the word Petra, means a huge rock like Gibraltar. Unmovable, huge. Church is not built on a man, no matter how good or strong they may be. Church is built on the revelation of who Jesus is, which is unmovable, unchanging, and will last for eternity, amen? So we need to understand that. So this is Jesus' church, and it says, I'll build my church. Jesus is building the church. He wants to build a church. Church was not man's creation, but church has taken some liberty. <laughs> Man has taken some liberty, rather. So we need to always go back and look at the instruction of Jesus. For It's his church. And I wonder sometimes, I don't have a church in mind. I'm not thinking of any church in particular, and certainly don't want to disrespect anyone. But sometimes I wonder, are you reading the same Bible? Are you listening to the same Jesus who, it's his church. It's not your church, it's his church. And I question myself all the time. Okay, Lord, what do you want? What is this, how is this filter and the scripture and all that? And I, again, I don't have a church in mind in any disrespect, but things are changing in our world today, but he changes not. And so we need to stay in line. This is his church, not our church, right? So we're built on that. So he has a purpose and a mission. And so he has purpose and then he has power to fulfill it. We'll get into that in September. We're gonna start a new series on, on the Holy Spirit, which represents power. We're gonna talk today about the purpose of our church and then we'll move on that in the future in September. But I wanna talk about that for a minute. minute. The purpose of the church is his church. The purpose is his church. Now let's take a look at Matthew 16, 19 real quick. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. He says, I'm giving you authority, power and authority. There you go. Power and authority not to do your own thing, but to do my thing, right? It's my church, Jesus says. So we want to make sure we walk that out. Okay, here we go. Matthew 28, 16. So two things Jesus did when he came back after the resurrection. We're talking about the number 40, 40 years. He was on the earth for 40 days. Not by accident, by on purpose, though. And so for 40 days, he spent time restoring. Uh, he went and saw Thomas, doubting Thomas, right? He went to Thomas. He built faith with his followers. 
He went and found Peter. Peter denied him three times and was just crushed and heartbroken and he just couldn't face him. All of a sudden, Jesus pops up, resurrects, and goes finds Peter and says, I want to restore you back to fellowship. He's building fellowship and relationship with man. He's shown himself to everybody. Hey, I am who I say I am. I do what I say I do. I am the Son of God. I'm resurrected in power, just like I said I would be. Showed himself strong. I believe for 40 years, 40 years in this church, God's been building our faith, increasing our faith, amen? Growing our faith. Why? For the next 40? Because 40 has, a, has an important, significant part of a preparing. It's a preparation time for what's next. He's been building our faith. I, I believe he's been restoring fellowship, relationship with man and God and man and each other, amen? Reaching the lost, coming back to fellowship with God and one another. I believe he's been showing himself strong for 40 years. I am who I say I am. You can trust me. You can take me at my word. We've seen him move and we've seen him work. And two other things he did, one of them, and we'll see right here, he gave the great commission. He gave instructions to church, which is purpose. And then he sent the Holy Spirit in Acts, which is power. So right here we'll see purpose. Matthew 28, 16 says, then 11 disciples, 11 what? 11 what? 11 disciples went to Galilee. We know there's 11 because Judas had taken his life. There was 12, now there's 11. To the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make what? Disciples. Who's making disciples? So we have disciples making? What do disciples do? They make? I thought disciples just went to church. No. No, no, no. Disciples make? If you're going to be a disciple, you're going to be a disciple maker. Come on, somebody. We don't just go to church. We make disciples. Disciples make disciples. Go to all nations in. That's a great commission. So the purpose of the church, disciples make disciples. We're to be disciples and be disciple makers. We've given us, he's given us the power and authority to do that, to go and make disciples. There's work to do, and it is to make disciples. The interesting thing to me is we live in a country that professes to be 84 to 87% Christian, and I'm like, what? <laughs> then why are we in such a mess? Now, it would be different if we were 84 to 87% disciples. It's a whole different ballgame. So is Christian disciple the same thing? No. Christian is when you get Jesus as your Savior and Lord. But know what? It doesn't stop there. That's the starting point. Now you can build a relationship and you can be like Christ. You have to be a convert before you can be a disciple. But too many people stop with the salvation experience. And the reality is two people, many people don't even know what that is anymore. So I don't know about you, I don't watch these shows anymore. I used to watch like the awards show, the music awards show, and I watch all these sport, sports things and people get to the microphone and they wanna, they wanna they, you know, they're, they're, their life is living like the world, but in that moment they just wanna thank God. I'm like, for what? Because you're living like the devil, my friend. You know, it's like that, come on, man. It's like Christians, right? Talking about disciples, I'm not trying to be I flip in or ugly or anything like that, but what, there's, a, there's a deeper thing that needs to happen in our lives. Salvation is just the start. And we need to be disciples making disciples. That is the purpose of God, and that's what the power is for. A Christian disciple are two different things. There's, there's different things there. We can't stop at just becoming a Christian. We need to keep moving on and become a disciple. And our salvation experience is just really the beginning. And so we need to follow and obey the teachings of Jesus. Go and make disciples. Disciples make disciples. And that's people that follow and obey the teachings of Jesus as we just saw right there. Listen, it's not about just getting your ticket punched to heaven or getting your fire insurance, people. It starts there. But now it's about connecting with God and with each other and connecting with a local church that will help you be a disciple and disciple other people. Let me give you what, uh, I, I got this out of, this is funny, I do a, a lot of research on disciple there. Um, I'm not gonna give you the definition because I thought this description of it was really fascinating. And I got it from Wikipedia, which we know everything in Wikipedia is true. <laughs> but this was really good. Let me just share this one with you. If there's anything in there that's true, maybe it's this right here. A disciple in ancient biblical world actively imitated both the life and teaching of the master. It was a deliberate apprenticeship, now listen to this, which made the fully formed disciple a living copy of the master. Amen. I love that. 
What's a disciple? A living copy of the master. Who are we to be Christians? No, no, no. We're supposed to be living copies of the master. What is our purpose? To be a living copy of the master. As individuals, absolutely. But as a church, when living copies of the masters come together, then the church becomes a living copy of the master. Amen? The church of Jesus Christ, we're a living copy of the master. That's who we're to be. Take a look at Ephesians 5.1 for me this morning. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Be imitators. What is a disciple? He's an imitator of God. He's a living copy of the master. Amen. And I love how it says of, of God as dear children because I love that picture with this innocence that we have and as God our father and just wanting to do and please him. But we all know this, that, that kids, you know, kids imitate what you do and that's good and bad, right? I mean, sometimes you're going to someone's house and you better be on your best behavior. You know, say, you don't give, you don't tell them all, all the things you know about mom and dad. You know, you know, you better act right. You better behave, or you're gonna be in trouble when you get home. You never said that, mom. That was dad. Dad always, you know, with us. Right? Anyway, so, uh, so one day uh, years ago, uh, when my kids were in school and they were young, uh, one day my oldest daughter was picked up from school by my mother-in-law, and so they got in the car, and my and my daughter just looked at her and and told my mother, "Hey, grandma, hey," and then said like the worst four-letter curse word you could ever say. Right there, and my mother-in-law was so shocked that she pulled the car over and said, what'd you say? Like, I'm like, why do you make her repeat it? <laughs> right? So she repeated it, of course, and so my mother-in-law got on the phone to Jessamy, and I remember this day, Jessamy and I were out, and so Jessamy's on the phone and like, are you kidding? Seriously? Oh, I can't believe that. Okay, all right, I'm sorry, thank you. And she hangs up the phone, I'm like, what's that about? And she goes, well, mom picked up Callie from school this morning, she got in the car and used this word, and said the word, and I said, are you kidding me? She got that from your family because my family doesn't talk that way. <laughs> She's not saying the night at your parents' house anymore, that's it, we're not going there. <laughs> it was funny, not funny, but in the moment we're like, what is happening here? And we're like, oh, school and all this kind of stuff. Anyways, my daughter gets home, and we wanted to make sure that we knew exactly what she said, so she told us. And, uh, you know, it was just interesting, because we said, well, where'd you get that? And she said, well, a little boy in my class. And so we're like, well, does he talk like that all the time? Yeah, he talks like that all the time. We're like, well, honey, I know it's going to be hard, but, but you're not allowed to play with that little boy. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, you could, you know, friends or whatever, but you're not allowed to play with that little boy. Okay. And so uh, the next week at church, after church, after second service was out in the main lobby, Chris, this is years ago, and uh, all of a sudden just shaking hands, saying goodbye, and a lady came up and said, Pastor Don, I, I want to talk to you about something. I'm like, okay. Sure, whatever. And she said, um, my son came home uh, from school and said that your daughter's not allowed to play with him anymore. <laughs> I'm like, really? <laughs> Jessamy. <laughs> so you know what? I, I got to get ready for the next service. It was after second service. Like, you know, I got to ready for the next service. Next week, next Sunday already. And uh, Jessamy will be right. Jessamy, say he wants to talk to you. And uh, it was a church kid. I was thinking, those worldly people in school, that's it. But it was a church kid. But the, the point is not where they came from. The point is, where did they learn it? Right? Why? Because we're imitators. Look at what it says in the, uh, Ephesians 5.1 in the Amplified. Therefore, be imitators of God. Copy him and follow his example. As well-beloved children imitate their father. And so we should think like him, act like him, talk like him, respond like him, love like him, forgive like him. Right? Take authority like him. Confront the enemy like him. Imitators, disciples, an imitator of the master, like dear children. And we imitate the father. Imitate the father. I have a question for you, and please don't respond out loud. But would you consider yourself a disciple? And maybe the better question is, would others around about you consider you a disciple? Because sometimes I think we just don't know. I mean, after a while, and things get watered down, or we're in it for a while, maybe we miss it, but... Thank goodness for maybe other people, maybe that can help us see when we've kind of slipped or kind of gone astray a little bit. And really the, the idea is here, we're not talking about being a Christian. We're not even talking about being a tree of life. Or we're not talking about a church attender. We're not talking about being non-denominational, charismatic. We're not talking about being Pentecostal. We're not talking about being a Baptist or Catholic. We're talking about being an imitator of Christ. Talking about being a disciple, that's our purpose. Are you the one who, again, thinks like him, acts like him, serves like him? We need to become a disciple. Discipleship is so important, but to be honest with you, it sounds so boring. <laughs> so like that discipleship thing, does that mean we've got to go to a bunch of classes? And so we have a bunch of classes for you here, but we don't call them discipleship because you think that way, right? It's like, so we very cleverly disguise it so you would have no idea. <laughs> of course, we know that you know what it is, but... 
We have lots of classes here for discipleship. Why? Because discipleship's so important. I mean, we got other things that we can do, mind you. I mean, we're raising up leaders, finding curriculum, spending time. Listen, it's not because we're bored or we need to give people something to do. It's because discipleship is so important. You need to learn about them so you can live like them, amen? You can need to learn what he said, how he talks, how he responds, so you can be an imitator of Jesus. So yes, we have discipleship classes. We have to be in all those classes. It's a good thing, not a bad thing. In fact, it's a small price to pay to be a disciple, to be quite honest with you. To get, I, I would have liked a little more amen right there, but anyways. <laughs> Thank you, Eric, for that. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Eric. He has a heads up all the discipleship classes. He has to give a, a big amen for that. I thought you'd stand on your feet and wave the white hanky or something, but we have classes for you. We have a You Belong, which is a membership class. Identify, unit identification if you are here last week. We have discipleship classes, growth track that helps you understand how God's wired you. We have a spiritual gift test. We have a disc test. We have things that, because you're wired a certain way for a reason, for a reason. God wired you a certain way because he has something for you to do. Uh, we have uh, uh, Next Steps, which helps you understand some of the, the basic beliefs here at Tree of Life, foundational things that will help you grow. Why do we have those things? Because we're all supposed to be disciples. It's not busy work. If you look at your life, and I'm not going to try and be hard and twist arms and get you in it or guilt you into it, but listen, we spend a lot of time doing other things, not being disciples, not being discipled. Can I say it that way? and or discipling other people. And so we have groups. We have small groups that are starting here, maybe the right on the front end of September. The next couple of weeks, you'll see group link and how you can get in groups. You can go online, see everything, register for everything I just talked about, or go to the Welcome Center, but you need to. Why? Because we need to be disciples, and that's part of the process. If we're not in a discipleship process, guess what we're doing? We're in a world process. Whether we realize it or not, we're either becoming more like Christ or becoming more like the world. There is no in-between, no middle ground there. And so you got to go deeper. And, and, and I, I want to encourage you, it's not just going to happen if you just come Sundays. That's not enough. It's good, and you need to. And we're going to always share the word, teach the word, preach the word with you, and give you an opportunity to go deeper in your walk with the Lord. But can I just say, our Sunday morning is, is focused, in a, in a sense, more for people coming to Christ. For those of you that are already know Christ as Savior and Lord, you need to be growing. You need to be in discipleship and growing and maturing. But this, sometimes Sunday morning, is the only shot we have of people that don't know Jesus. And so I'm just going to let you know, again, I did last week that in, from 2010 to today in our Sunday morning services, we've seen over 11,000 people give their life to Christ. Come on, somebody. 11,000 people. And that's awesome. And that's our chance. But discipleship's going to happen more outside these four walls than in these four walls. It's going to happen more in your four walls. Either you're going to go with somebody else's four walls or they're going to come to yours or a class or online with all the things that we have. And let me say this, and I don't, I'm going to say this very carefully. You know my heart. I don't want to be defensive. I don't have anybody in mind just to prove a point here this morning. I want you to know that. I hear sometimes when people leave the church, and that's fine. Hey, if this isn't the church for you, no, feel, no, no hard feelings. It doesn't hurt my feelings. I want you to be where God has you. But sometimes people will come and say, Pastor, we're, just, we're, we're, we're going on, we're going to leave and go to another church, or we're going to find another church. And I'll ask, okay, how come is God leading you out? Because we believe it's a spiritual decision, right? God sets you in, and if God leads you on, he leads you on. And they'll say this sometimes, we're just not getting fed here. And I'm just like, okay. I said, well, I'd starve too if I only ate one time a week. <laughs> I don't say it like that, mind you, because I'm super nice. But... Uh, <laughs> But that's the reality of it. That's okay. That's okay. But anybody eating one day, a, one day a week is going to starve in some way, shape, or form, spiritually as well. You have to be a self-feeder. Discipleship is a self-feeding process as well. You get involved there. And let me say this too. I don't necessarily eat here on Sunday morning. I'm trying to feed. I eat all the other days of the week. I have to. We have to. And I don't want to be defensive. I hope you didn't hear that now. I'm stressing the importance of discipleship and continuing on daily in your growing in the things of God. It's the same spiritually. We have to feed, be fed and feed ourselves spiritually. And I just want to say also, I'm thankful for the feeding that I get here. I'm thankful for the, the friends that I have pouring into my life. I'm, I'm thankful for mentors. I'm, I'm thankful for spiritual fathers. I'm thankful for people that I call for prayer. They call and can pray for me. I'm thankful for all that. But you know what else I'm thankful for? I'm, I'm glad that they're there when they need They're always there when I need them, and I'm thankful for that. But you know what I'm thankful for? I'm thankful for the opportunity, the ability to sit down with the Word of God myself and read the Word that's alive and powerful and, and speaking to my heart and soul. I'm thankful for a relationship with the Holy Spirit that I can talk to Him every single day and I can find time in prayer and lift my heart, my voice, my frustrations, my heart up to heaven. I'm thankful that I can have the mind of Christ 
according to the word of God and have wisdom when I need it. I'm thankful there's places I can go when I need it. I'm glad that they're there, but I'm thankful that I can grow and mature in the things of God by being a disciple. And here's the reality for a disciple. The more you're a disciple, the less you need to be dependent on the other things. Thank goodness they're there. I'm thankful for altar ministry workers. If you need it, and have hands laid on you. Totally into that. Believe that. You need to. I do as well. But here's what I believe. The more that you're discipling or being a disciple, rather, the more you're being a disciple, the more you grow. We'll talk about just a second. The less time you need to go get help. And getting help's not a bad thing. Don't hear, don't hear that in there. We're here to help you. We're here to create environments that will help you. We have people who can help you. But there's things that you can do that will be a help to you in your life in discipleship. Luke 6.40, discipleship will help you. Luke 6.40. Uh, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is a disciple is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Disciples need to be perfectly trained. Well, what, trained, well, how is that perfect? That's not what that word literally means. That's our translation is your, what your mind's thinking right now. Perfect, like no mistakes. It's not what it means. In the Greek, that word has three meanings in this context. Three meanings, perfect in the Greek. A disciple, perfectly trained. This is the three meanings. Mature, that you grow in the things of God. We all need to. From that moment you receive Christ and you're, you're a babe in Christ, you're a baby in, uh, say in the things of God, that you need to grow every day, every month, every year. I'm, I'm not where I need to be right now, but I'm a whole lot farther than I was last year. Why? Because I'm maturing in the things of God. Uh, perfect means in this context, fully equipped. Man, I need things for my life. Those people, teachers we just talked about, God is equipping you to do what you do. God's equipping me to do what I do. We had a child dedication last week. God's equipping parents. Listen, that's where we get our equipping from. We need to do natural things to be equipped, but a disciple pursuing the things of God is spiritually equipped to do. I, man, I need this for my life. Okay, are you being discipled? No. Well, how are you going to get that then? <laughs> I'm just going to ask God for it. Okay. Well, God says to be a disciple to get that. What do you think he's going to do? <laughs> he's not going to go against his word. And then the last one is this, to be repaired, fixed, restored, and mended. Being a disciple. What does that mean? Disciples in a discipleship process. Disciples are repaired, fixed, restored, and mended. I need some of that in my life. Can you pray for me? I can pray for you, but let me tell you how you get it. By being a disciple, being an imitator of Christ, pressing into the things of God. An outflow of that, a result of that is Repair, fix, restore, mend it. Amen? Amen? Now, I don't want you to hear from me this morning. I want to hear from the founder. I want you to hear from the founder. Let's take a listen. The only way we become functional is through the new birth and through the word, surrendering ourselves to the word and the Holy Ghost and becoming a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ and becoming like him because he is fully equipped to deal with everything. And if we're like him, we're fully equipped. And he is mature. And if we become like him, we walk in maturity. Hello? And he certainly is not broken or, or need of mending. He is whole. Emotionally, physically, spiritually, Jesus is whole. Anybody getting this? Now, I want, I want to tell you something. Don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. You cannot be mended and whole and come to wholeness by living out of the past or by poking a finger and blaming someone else for the way you are now. You must get into the Word of God and put your focus on the Lord Jesus Christ and who you are in Him and learn through the Word of God and through prayer, praise be unto God, as to who you are, then mending and repair and wholeness will come. And we want to focus it every place else. And we rise not above. I'd still be a drunk today, even though the Lord loved me. And at the cross, when I met Jesus... He said, you've been delivered from your drunkenness, but I'd still be a drunk unless I decided to become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ and be like him. But I want you to understand something. The way out is Jesus, the word of God, the Holy Ghost, the blood of a lamb, the blood of the cross, the resurrection, the resurrection power, the power that abides with him, the anointing that breaks the yoke of bondage. Jesus left nothing out for the life that is yet to come or for this life. And yet the church is permeated with politics, it's permeated with governments, it's permeated with programs, it's permeated with everything and think tanks and philosophy and traditions and ceremonies that look good but rob the people of power. Yeah. 
and identity with God and their salvation and their resurrection and who they are. We need to get back to who we are in Christ. We need to zero in on the cross. We need to zero in on the empty tomb. We need to zero in on the Lord Jesus Christ and get back to the Word and becoming as He is and thinking as He thinks and walking as He walks and talking as He talks and praying what He prays. Mm. You'll be free, I'll be free, the, the community will be free, glory to God, and Jesus can come for his bride. Come on, somebody, come on. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I want to say, preach it, Dad. Come on, right? Amen. Now you know where it comes from, right? That's my mom right there. Hey, and I also want to say, I know what you're thinking right now. Why can't we just listen to him? Because I'm here. <laughs> what would I do? All right? Amen. What a great word. That's our heart and spirit that's always been this place. It's always going to be this place. We believe that. We believe in the power of discipleship, being like Jesus, being an imitator of our Father. It fixes men's repairs, restores things in your life. And many things that we're believing for, for God from, for people to pray for us, will be found in your discipleship. You're growing to be more like him, just being an imitator of Christ. So we need to be disciples. It's important for you and I. Um, and, and what we do, and this world, this world needs us, this world needs us, this world doesn't need, I don't know how, I don't know if I'm gonna say this right, this world doesn't need a, a world full of Christians, it needs a world full of disciples, right. imitators of Christ. Yeah. It, it needs a church, not just full of Christians and churchgoers, it needs a church full of disciples. It'll change the world, because a disciple will disciple, it'll reach out and help somebody, we'll do what Jesus did, respond the way Jesus responded, and that's important for you and I. I remember, uh, my, my wife is so good at this, she, she really is. It, it's hard for me to do that sometimes in places and, and respond that way like Jesus would. I, I can preach, put me in front of thousands and I'm happy to, to preach the word and I love it. I, I can do that all day long, but go someplace like Walmart or H-E-B and you know, I find somebody that, with a need, that, that really stretches me beyond my comfort zone sometimes. But my wife's amazing at it. She'll stop in the middle of H-E-B or Walmart and have a prayer line right I'm like we go down the grocery store and a lady and she won't even know him just feel like she's crying or something and Jessamy will stop her and want to pray and I'll stand there and say I, I'm just gonna go get some more toilet paper just because you know we've learned you need to stock up on that stuff I'll go get some more and she'll pray right there the other day we were there not long ago and a lady came down the aisle crying we walked into the aisle a lady came down the aisle crying walked past both of us and she turned and said that lady was crying and I, and I looked at her and I said oh, what do you want to do <laughs> What do I need to go get, you know, or whatever. And so I love that, I love that. And not everybody's that way, but you know what? That's what a disciple does. It doesn't have to be some big moment at all. It's just take time, a disciple takes time. Because if we're imitators of Jesus, what would Jesus do in that moment? He would take a moment for someone that's hurting and someone that's lost and someone's crying. And just, to, uh, we were traveling on our way, I uh, can't remember where we were going, Jesse and I were going somewhere. We changed planes in Houston. We had a little bit of a layover, so we are getting something to eat. There was a table, a family of four, a mom and three boys at a table, and we just had sat down, and, and uh, we saw them all start, there. the mom took a phone call, and they all started crying, just sobbing right there. And so Jess, he's like, oh my gosh, I wonder what's happening, I wonder what's going on right there, and I'm like, I don't know. And she's like, well, something is, and I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, oh, they're not gonna ask me to go over there, are you, you know, whatever, and shame on me. But then when the waiter, it was the same waiter, came over, Jess, and he said, was that, is everything all right with that table? And he's like, I think they just got some bad news, and now they're all crying, and, and so Jasmine goes, well, make sure we get their check. We want to maybe something nice that will help them. We want to get their ticket. And so I thought, well, that's good. We can do that. Praise the Lord. And then we got up to leave. Jasmine says, uh, we need to go over to that table. And I said, I just got their check. <laughs> and so she walks over to the table and talks to the mom. And, and the mom's all embarrassed but appreciative. And just like they're hugging in Houston and crying. And I know it was really sweet. It was a disciple. That's what disciples do. Come on. This is being a disciple. And I just... That's who we are. That's our purpose. One more story real quick. I, uh, my, my youngest daughter's here, and, and I believe it was with her. I wasn't sure. It happened years ago when we were at Chick-fil-A, and uh, there was an accident, a car wreck, as we came out. And uh, I'm like, well, we need to go check and make sure everybody's okay. So there was a gentleman whose back was to us and two teenage girls in the other car. And everybody was out of the car by now, and the girls were just, the driver especially, she was just so shaken up and just crying and scared. And, and I walked up behind the guy, and I, I just kind of came around the side of him and said, hey, man, you all right? And he says, oh, hey, Pastor Don, yeah, I'm good, man. Thanks for stopping. And I'm like, well, who are you? <laughs> I go to your church. I said, oh, it's great to meet you. Sorry for the accident. You're all right? He's like, yeah. And then the little girls really shook up, and, and uh, her friend was there. And uh, I said to her friend and then to this gentleman, I said, why don't you guys go get, like, take some pictures. You need to get license plates, damage of the car, where it happened. 
I'll have her get her insurance out. And, um, and so they did. And I walked up to the girl and I said, are you okay? And she's just bawling and sobbing. I said, it's going to be all right. And I said, do you mind if I pray for you? And she said, yeah, please. And so I just put my hand on her shoulder and prayed for her for just a moment. And then when she opened her eyes, her friend was standing there looking at us. And she looks at her friend and says, it's okay, he's my pastor. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, really? Oh, I had no idea. That's awesome. And uh, you never know who's there. I had no idea who they were, no idea. You know what I was doing that day? I wasn't being their pastor. I was being a disciple. It's not that pastors that heal everybody and reach everybody. It's disciples that do that. So, and I just believe that God orchestrated our paths in these days. You know who God's looking to send across the path of another person, a disciple? Someone that he knows is an imitator of him that will do what he does, say what he says, pray what he prays, right? We wanna be disciples, that's our purpose. That's who we're to be, be a disciple. And uh, so many other wonderful stories and things for time's sake, I wanna let you know it. We want you to be disciples. We want this church to be known as a church of disciples. I mean, I, I hear people all the time, oh, you're at that church? Oh, that's a great church. That's a nice church. Oh, they're helping a lot of people. And I think that's wonderful. And I'm so thankful. You saw all the opportunities and your generosity and serving helps us do that. But you know what I ought to be known for? Is being a church of disciples. A disciple of Jesus. We're disciples making disciples. And listen, I, I said this earlier, and you know, we got the, some giveaways today, and, but we have a lot of great things in the merch store out there for you. You can buy shirts and caps and hoodies and sunscreens and, and uh, sunglasses, and you can buy fans, and you can, you can buy cups and mugs and all kinds of things, and you can buy pop sockets. You can never have enough pop sockets, right? And uh, all of us says tree of life, and I would say to you today, don't wear it unless you're gonna be a disciple. If all of us are out wearing that stuff, don't just wear it here at church. Don't always just wear it at the mega food distribution. Wear it out in the public when you're going to the grocery store and then you're gonna be known. This church can be known for being disciples. We wanna help people, right? And also, that's why we don't sell bumper stickers. Oh no. Because you may live like Jesus, but you drive like okay. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. You don't drive like a disciple. <laughs> All right, I got one more scripture and I got to close. I'm going a little bit long. Uh, John 8, 31 through 32. Talking about purpose, talking about purpose. We're people of purpose. The measure of a great church is we're people of purpose. It's the purpose that's great. It's the people that's great. And so we're doing what God's called us to do and that is to be disciples, disciples. And here's what he says in John 8, 31 through 32. To the Jews who believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. So he's like saying, come on. I know you want to act like you're a disciple and you may have been following me around, but if you hold to my teachings and you're really a disciple, I don't know what people have told you. Oh, just go along and follow him. Be one of the crowd that gets, you know, the 5,000 fed and stuff like that. That's kind of cool and stuff like that. We're a follower of Jesus. I was there when they fed 5,000. Jesus says, if you hold to my teachings, not just attend church on Sundays, not if you just go to the mega food distribution, but he says, if you hold to my teachings, then you're really my disciples. Disciples hold to the teachings of Jesus and it goes on to say this in verse 32. Then, say then. then. Then what? Then those that hold to the teachings, if you hold to the teachings, you'll be my disciples. Then, which means that was the condition in verse 31. Now the result in verse 32 is this. Then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. And listen to me. We love that scripture. It's on our refrigerators and mirror and everywhere and we celebrate it and we should. But do you realize it's attached to the scripture about disciples? So that says to me, those who hold to the teachings of Jesus who are really his disciples will know freedom in its greatest measure. Yes, I need some freedom in my life. Hold to the teachings of Jesus. No, I need you to pray for me. Okay, I'll do that, but hold to the teachings of Jesus. No, I need to, I need to go to church for a, a couple of weeks. I got things are happening in my life kind of tough. Okay, that's great, and you should, but hold to the teachings of Jesus. Because the greatest expression of freedom it's found in discipleship, apparently. So disciples, what do disciples do? They live the freest truth of the word of God. I don't know how I have time to be a disciple. Well, do you have a time to experience the truest freedom that can be experienced? Well, yeah, I want that. You have to be a disciple. So it's all in the word right there. Purpose, disciples making disciples. That is our purpose, amen?